Section 1 of Sri Nyaneshwa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sri Nyaneshwar, A Short Sketch of His Life, 1275 to 1296. By Anonymous. Though from time immemorial the life of a householder has been held up even above that of a sannyasin, there are natures that feel an overwhelming attraction for the life of perfect freedom and joy, the life of penance undisturbed by the dust and heat of samsara, natures which, not content with the moderate liberty of the householder, crave for sannyasa with the same impatience with which a newly caught parrot struggles against the bars of the cage. Quote, what the little firefly is beside the brightness of the sun, what a grain of sand is beside the vastness of Mount Meru, so is the life of a householder when compared with that of a sannyasin. So said Swami Vivekananda on one occasion. So also thought Vital Pant, the father of Saint Nyaneshwar, a Brahmin by birth and a Kulkarni by profession. All the love of a devoted wife could not reconcile him to a worldly life. Before marriage he had been on a long pilgrimage, visiting every shrine in Gujarat and Maharashtra. Ever since his childhood he was a devotee of Sri Vital, or Vitopa, of Pandharpur, in the district of Sholapur. It is possible that this seed of devotion was well watered in his travels, and though for a time he settled down to married life, Yet it was not long before he repented. He longed to go to Benares and to become a sannyasin. But he was childless, and besides there was that difficulty, the permission of his wife. Footnote. This is a popular belief only. In the Shmitis, no allusion is made to the necessity of getting wife's permission. The only conditions laid down are 1. Birth of a son. 2. Performance of sacrifices and three, study of the Vedas. End of footnote. How was that permission to be got? Great as is our respect for the yellow robes, still the aspiring monk is allowed to pursue his ambition only if his wife allows him to leave her. What woman would cheerfully consent to bury her own happiness? No wonder, therefore, that Rukmini, wife of Vitalpant, withheld her permission. Let us not blame her. She was but a woman. But the mind of Vital Pant was unalterably fixed. He would be a sannyasin at all costs. Soon after his marriage, he had lost his parents and was at the request of his father-in-law, living at the latter's house at Alandi, a village fourteen miles from Pune. One day, he left his wife and all her people and went to Benares. There he sought and found the house of the Swami Ramananda, a celebrated sannyasin. Have you taken your wife's permission? asked Ramananda. But I have no wife, no child, boldly replied Vitalpant. Believing in his words, Ramananda gave him the yellow robes and allowed him to study under his care. But this episode, instead of ending here, had a melancholy course to run. The unsuspecting Ramananda became very fond of Vitalpant. Now Chaitan Yashram, and soon made him his chief disciple. One day he asked Vidapant, so we shall continue to call him in spite of his temporary change of life and habit, to look after the math and its inmates, and accompanied by a few disciples, went southward on a long pilgrimage to Rameshwar. Being himself a Maratha Brahmin, he chose the western route, visiting on his way sacred towns and rivers. It was impossible for him to avoid Alandi, then one of the principal centres of orthodox learning. Vital Pant must have foreseen his guru's prospective visit to Alandi, and that is perhaps why he did not accompany him. But the gods were determined to act prejudicially to him. At Alandi, Ramananda had, as usual, taken residence at the village temple, where in the evening he was saluted by a lady, the picture of grief and anxiety, looking older in appearance than she was in years. That woman was the disconsolate wife of Vital Pant. Ramananda blessed her with the words, Mayest thou have a son? 
The blessing was quite customary and had nothing curious about it. But thinking of her runaway husband, she could not repress a rather ironical smile at the benediction, though she did not utter a single word. Surprised at her conduct, Ramananda asked her what she meant. In the conversation that followed, it transpired that her husband had, even against her permission, and before she had any issue, renounced the world and had taken sannyasa at Benares. The mind of Ramananda became more uneasy when, after full investigation, he found out that the husband of the woman was no other than his favorite disciple, Vital Pant. Now further journey was at an end. He determined to set things right. So taking the wife, Rukmini, and her people with him, back he went to Benares. Surprised at the early and unexpected visit of his master, Vital Pant asked what had happened. With voice choked with rage, the master said, I had been to Alandi, you see, and then asked, almost ferociously, Have you any explanations to make? Disconcerted more by the word Alandi than even by the question, the disciple fell to the ground, made a clean breast of everything, and begged his guru's pardon. He would, he said, do anything to please his master. Then, said Ramananda, Take your wife and go back to Alandi and live the life of a householder. No doubt it was a critical moment and must sorely have tried the devotion of Vital Pant for his master. He did not like what he was directed to do, but disobedience being out of the question, he quietly took the hand of his wife and sped back to his village about 1261 AD, a householder again, there to spend the next twenty-two years of his life in poverty distress, and more terrible still, persecution. Did Ramananda believe that the people of Alandi would tamely submit to his decision? If so, he was entirely in the wrong. Did he make any provision whereby the path of Vital Pant might become less thorny? Did he now and then inquire how his disciple was faring, whether he was dead or living, happy or miserable? The answer is no. To his mind, the initiation of Vital Pant into the order of the sannyasins, based as it was on misrepresentation and fraud, was null and void ab initio. Such a man, he thought, might have changed his garb, but his ashram never. Even in yellow robes, Vital Pant was still a householder. He was really so during the last twelve years. The view of Ramananda might or might not be correct. The real question was, how would the people of Alandi receive their former friend? And if the prospect was that they would not be very friendly, why in the world should Vidal Pant have chosen Alandi for his residence instead of some other suitable city or village? Perhaps such considerations of prudence never occur to minds noble and pure, conscious of their own honesty of purpose and too unworldly to foresee meaner treatment at the hands of others. Another interesting question that occurs to one is, what was the duty of Rukmini when Ramananda ordered her husband back to Alandi? She knew the longing of her husband for moksha. She knew by experience how unhappy he would be when dragged to the worldly life. Was it not proper for her to sanction her husband's conduct? If the sannyasa of her husband was null and void, only because he had not her permission, surely was it not her duty to grant it, even at that late stage? The answer is difficult. Perhaps she was childless, and the Shastras allow the life of sannyasa only after the aspirant has got children. It is very difficult to decide this delicate question when we have no positive knowledge as to how far this rule of the Shastras was observed in the 13th century. Perhaps nobody was in the wrong, but one would fain wish so much gentleness and so much nobility went unpersecuted. Cruelly disappointed in his spiritual dreams, Vital Pant returned to Alandi, there to find another, perhaps keener, disappointment awaiting him. He was boycotted. His friends avoided him. The rest persecuted him. He had no friends but hunger and destitution. He had no hope except from the faith that in him lay. And yet this harassed, persecuted man had not one word of blame, of censure for his enemies. Gentle, meek, and uniformly forgiving, he blessed those that cursed him and went on, in spite of fatigue and privations, chanting the name of the Lord. Verily this ostracized Vidal Pant resembled that ideal sage so beautifully described by his son. Quote, 
He treads the earth lightly for fear the ant might be crushed under his feet, as the heron, which wishing to catch the fish, just plunges its beak into the stream without disturbing the water. So he is particular that the equanimity of others is not disturbed. When the cat moves its litter from one place to another, she holds it by the teeth. But does this action injure the litter? Certainly not. In a similar way, his actions do harm to nobody. His countenance is full of love, and before he opens his lips, the hearer is assured of the kindness of the words by the love beaming in the eyes. His look is lean and appearance quite ordinary, but don't presume to estimate the sweetness of the plantain fruit from the skin of the tree. Full of thought, he is generally silent. He never raises his hand against man or animal, or if at all he lifts it up, it is only to promise protection to others. Do you believe that a man of this type will ever handle the sword, or even the stick, or that he would be guilty of an act of violence? End quote. Footnote. The Dnayaneshwari is not, though it deserves to be, translated into English. All the renderings in this sketch, therefore, are specially made for it. End of footnote. In 1273 A.D., however, the tedium of his life was broken. In that year, his wife bore him a son, later named Nivritinat, literally, the Lord of Renunciation. Two years later was born Dev, the God of Knowledge, the subject of this short sketch. After him, Vidalpant had two children, one son and the other a daughter. They were named Sopanadev and Muktabai, the liberated. The joy which the parents felt at the birth of these children was not unalloyed. They had that hard battle to fight, the fight with poverty, and in that trying duel, the more spiritual the soldier, the fewer chances he has of success. Starvation was not new to them. The neglect of their friends and the cruel and almost vindictive persecution of their villagers had made them pretty familiar with it. What was worse was the consciousness that the children would have to inherit ostracism, with the possibility that the happiness of their life might be blasted. That was as iron to the soul of the fond parents, to live under a cloud, and that too from childhood, to grow up in misery and destitution, how agonizing! And yet the distressing thought did not break them, it only drew together the hearts of the family, the father, the mother, the brothers, and the sister. The children had no other company. They therefore played by the side of their parents. They heard their father talk of renunciation. They saw their mother practice self-denial. They had no regular schooling, but the very air they breathed was charged with religion, and the schooling they had at the feet of their parents was a great preparation for their future life. End of section 1, read by Sandra, in Nova Scotia, 2022. Section 2 of Sri Nanyeshwar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sri Nanyeshwar, a sketch of his life and teachings. By Anonymous. Precocious beyond comparison, of an extremely joyous disposition, and with the powers of the spirit early awakened, these children, if children they must be called, literally enjoyed their poverty, laughed at persecution, and drew the highest lessons of life from the most trying vexations. In all the works that they have left us, and they all wrote religious treatises, poems, etc., you will not find a single thought, one unguarded expression that reveals a trace of that misery which was their daily experience. The works of Nyanadev, our hero, better known by the name Dyaneshwar, are brimful of that ecstasy which mocks at sorrow and delights in suffering. He was not of a militant disposition. He was not the kind of man described by St. Ram Dass. Quote, His piercing look strikes terror into the heart of the wicked and makes them conscious of the meanness of their souls. End quote. On the contrary, all his conquests have been conquests of love. It is true that a miracle worked by him is said to have brought the pandits of Paitan down to their knees, when we remember the strong strictures, footnote, 
on one occasion he says is it not wonderful that ordinary people should insist that a real sage must occasionally exercise supernatural powers when we remember that he is quite oblivious of his own person even what a stupid bigotry End of footnote. he has passed against any abuse of spiritual power we might well pause before we accept the story the obstinacy of the pandits must have been conquered by his love he was too modest to argue too forbearing to quarrel too gentle to fight if in moments of ecstasy felt while discoursing upon religion he allowed words of pride to escape him it was no mean vulgar personal pride he was proud of his god of his guru and of his granta while extolling the granta he never praised himself but attributed all inspiration to the grace of his guru though poor in wealth india is by no means so in spirit and yet in all the religious biography of so many centuries one hardly comes across such a picture of magnificent spirituality thriving in the wilderness of crushing misery but whatever happiness the ostracized family derived from one another's company was soon to end an event occurred which shows to what extent the perverse obstinacy of blind orthodoxy can go the ceremony of wearing the sacred thread is of extreme importance in the life of a brahmin boy in fact real brahminhood dates from that ceremony every one therefore can understand how anxious vidalpant and his wife must have been to get that ceremony upanayana of nivritinath and nyaneshwar now ten and eight years old respectively performed they hoped that time and their own forbearance had appeased the anger of their villagers and that no further difficulty on the point would be raised they therefore broached the subject before the leading luminaries of their neighbourhood hard-hearted though scarcely hard-headed shastris who constituted themselves as the sole repositories of religious wisdom but they were in no mood to grant justice or even mercy for a sannyasin returning to the second ashram they thought there was but one punishment the sin was monstrous and the sentence death believing without reason that their own death would make the path of their children smooth and their thread ceremony possible vidalpant and his wife once more saluted those brahmins trusted their children to the care of god walked straight to allahabad and there in the holy confluence of the three rivers ended by one plunge their life and what was more bitter still their suffering in the absence of detailed and authentic account the conduct of vidalpant appears to be improperly meek and extremely impracticable did he try to find out his old guru or failing him some other pandit at benares or even in the deccan who would point to some favourable text on the point we do not know footnote see the mitakshara commentary on yananavalkya smriti part three verse two hundred and eighty for the penance prescribed for the sannyasin who wants to become a householder the offence is not classed under the mahapataka or great sins but under upapataka only hinyaneshva the commentator quotes from parashara a passage which says a sannyasin is purified when he performs three krishashas and three chandrayanas and all the ceremonies that have been performed since his childhood now krishakras and chandrayanas are well known and simple prayashitas another prayashita quoted from samvarta is equally simple the offence therefore of the religious legislators of alandi becomes to say the least monstrous End of footnote. the very text on which the shastris of alandi depended for their memorable but scarcely commendable sentence is not available the facts however are faithfully recorded by mukta bai the sister of dhyaneshwar and have to this day passed unchallenged so ends the sad chapter in the history of vidalpant's life now begins the brilliant career of his children as serene and cheerful as ever they discussed what the next step should be nivritinath perhaps heartily sick of the dogmatism of the leading brahmins of alandi was for no submission Quote, what is that thread ceremony to me he cried i am holiness incarnate End quote. but the hero of our present sketch born as he was to lead the people instead of defying them thought conciliation to be the best course quote, true brother true he said 
You are holiness incarnate. Who could doubt your purity? But look at the people and our duty by them. End quote. He then proceeded to explain how discipline is the ruling factor in society and pointed out how it devolved, especially on the wise, to obey its laws and to uphold its honor. Quote, Don't you see how, like an army without a general, the society is going to rack and ruin? If we, the wise, refuse to obey it, why should the ignorant do so, when they have every motive for defiance? Do let us go, brother, and bring the Shastris round. End quote and forthwith they repaired to the leading Brahmins. Quote, we can't disobey the Shastras, they said, nor can we alter them. Your thread ceremony is impossible, but if you get a permit from the Pandits of Paitan, then we are prepared to admit you to the privileges of a Brahmin. End quote. That we shall try to do, said Nyaneshwar, and off they started to Paitan. Footnote. On the river Godavari, in the Nizam's territory, Paitan and Diogiri are both situated in the Nizam's dominions, but in those days they formed part of Maharashtra. End of footnote. It is said that even the Pandits of Paitan at first refused to admit this brotherhood into the fold of Brahmanism, but, being amazed at the miracle which Nyaneshwar wrought by making a buffalo recite verses from the Rig Veda, they, in terror and reverence, yielded and gave the necessary permit which enabled Nivritinath and Nyaneshwar to have their thread ceremony performed. But the putting on of the sacred thread was not with them the beginning of study. Rather, it was the beginning of their life's work, religious revival. At the feet of their father they had drunk deep of spiritual learning. Nivritinath, when a stripling of seven had come across a great sage, Sri Gaininath, at Triambakeshwar, near Nashik, who, struck with the attainments of the lad, initiated him into the mysteries of yoga. Yaneshwar, his junior by two years, became his disciple and throughout his short life referred to his elder brother as his spiritual master at the touch of whose blessing hand he had penetrated the unknown. But he was not satisfied with his own spiritual freedom. He had love infinite for his ignorant brothers and sisters in Maharashtra, and ever since his childhood his mind was busy thinking as to the best way he should help them. End of section 2 Read by Sandra, 2022
The Gita has a peculiar fascination for the leaders, especially in times of national awakening. We know how that book has largely inspired many of the national leaders of the day. We know how in his solitary traveling throughout India, Vivekananda had only the Gita and a photo of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa for his companion. We know how it has influenced the national movement and has given it a specially spiritual character. So also it affected the Maharashtra of St. Yaneshwar's time. Apart from its singular beauty of expression, clarity of vision and breadth of outlook, the Gita is a book, the word meaning of which even an ordinary man very little advanced in Sanskrit can understand. The writer of this sketch has seen persons who scarcely able to distinguish the set from the Anit roots, and quite ignorant of the ten conjugations and six tenses in Sanskrit, are yet able to give in an offhand manner the sense of any verse from the Gita. This sort of Sanskrit literature found great favor with Maratha people of the time of this religious revival. The Ramayan, the Mahabharat, the Bhagavat, though the last is occasionally more difficult than the first two, and a few other Puranas were the scriptures from which both the saints and their followers drew inspiration. No wonder, therefore, that our hero should have selected therefrom a piece which has engaged the attention of the greatest intellects of the country during centuries and through all vicissitudes of the national life. And he has delivered the message of Lord Krishna in a work that will last as long as the Marathi language. It is impossible to describe the supreme beauty of this book except in language which, to those who have not read it, may appear hyperbolical. Never have the dry bones of the Vedanta been clothed in a richer manner. The provinces of poetry and of philosophy generally so unfriendly here meet in such harmonious perfection that the reader is unable to determine whether the poem belongs to the former or to the latter. The similes are exquisite, never far-fetched, uniformly elegant, and often sublime. They dazzle the mind of the reader by their number and variety. He piles illustrations upon illustrations, and by a succession of images brings home the sense of the text, with a force and power that are truly admirable. St. Dhyaneshvar himself was not conscious of the brilliance of his powers. In the opening chapter he says, quote, I have presumed to attempt to explain the Gita without sufficiently taking into account the difficulty of the task. I can hope to succeed only if the impossible becomes possible, if the glowworm can give light to the sun, or a tiny bird take out all the water of the sea, to appreciate the vastness of the sky, we ourselves must have vastness of imagination. So to explain the meaning of the Gita, the commentator must be at least equal to the author in intelligence and learning. I am, however, supported in my venture only by the consciousness that I am but the figurehead, and really, my guru, the great Nivritideo, is speaking. When wooden dolls move like animate beings, is that because they have life or power of movement? Is it not, on the contrary, the power of the man who holds the strings? So I need have no misgiving. The desire-yielding cow is my mother. I might be as contemptible as iron, but is not the philosopher's stone there to convert me into gold? A little later, however, all his diffidence drops off, and he says, Does the sun appear bigger than a man's hand? And yet, does it not fill the earth with light? So short are these words, but the meaning is deeper than the sea, and as infinite as the sky. It will remove all doubt, and like a kalpa tree, satisfy your desires. The sweetness of nectar, the charm of music, and the cool fragrance of the southern wind, all combined, will not stand comparison with the supreme excellence of this story. It will bring joy to all the senses at one and the same time. If sugared milk can cure you of diseases, why spoil the palate with bitter doses of medicines? So if you want moksha, you need not torture the senses and try to conquer the mind. Just hear this story and you will get it, moksha. His pride of the Marathi language is manifested in the following words. Do I hear you say that these are only Marathi words, and hence inevitably lacking in beauty? Marathi words, no doubt, but words that will put the best Sanskrit composition into shade. They are sweeter than nectar and more refreshing than the southern wind. Mark this, my friends. 
If you dispassionately read the Sanskrit Gita and my Marathi commentary, you cannot say which is superior to which. End quote. Though almost the first Marathi writer of distinction, he never apologizes for the use of the vernacular, and this is the more remarkable because even to the end of the 18th century, Marathi writers had always the dread of the pandits in their minds when they commenced writing. They either apologized for the use of Marathi, explained that the use of the vernacular was necessary while educating the masses, or at least reviled the pandits for their scornful behavior towards the language of the people. Yaneshwar did none of these things. He neither quarreled with the pandits nor justified his behavior, but wrote, or rather spoke, in the glad certainty that his book was bound to make a mark. His words of pride must never be mistaken for that vulgar pride which is at once odious and contemptible. On the contrary, it is the warmth of ecstasy that has tinged his words with occasional boldness. Otherwise, he was the same modest, unassuming Yaneshwar as ever. This is no place to describe the beauties of the work or to trace the delightful picture of the eager, candid, and doubting Arjuna so consistently developed throughout the book. One or two extracts, however, will not be entirely out of place. While commenting on the 10th and 11th verses of the 6th chapter, this is how Gyaneshvar describes the fit place for practicing yoga. Quote, let it be a quiet place, with a beautiful cluster of trees protecting it from the hottest rays of the sun. Bits of sunshine peeping through the trees must, however, illumine it, and the wind, gentle, cool, and fragrant, be there to accompany it. No noise there except the sweet prattle of the parrot or the humming of the bee. A few ducks and swans with three or four chakravaka birds would not be entirely unwelcome, and if occasionally the cuckoo coos, or a solitary peacock dances, well, we shall not drive them away. In short, the place must amuse us, and at the same time awaken all the latent powers of the soul. It must purify the worldly, stimulate the sataka, and must even tempt a king, if he visits it, to lay aside his crown and practice tapasya. End quote. Arjuna, eager to see the virat form of the Lord, and yet uncertain whether he would deign to confer the favor on him, says, But another desire has taken possession of my heart. Shall I unfold it? And why should I not? If the fish does not wish to trouble water with its presence, where is it to go? If the babe hesitates to suck milk from the breast of its mother, who else will feed it? And if we do not approach you, who will help us? I do not know whether I deserve to have the wish granted to me. Like the patient, my duty is to tell the symptoms to the physician. Whether I am fit or not is not my lookout. Does not a hungry person feel that he would devour the whole of this world? It is natural that I crave to see thee, O Lord, but the decision rests with you and no other. I know that you will fulfill this desire, not because I am fit by virtue of spirituality, but because your munificence knows no bounds. Did you not grant moksha to your enemies, the demons? If your enemies can claim the privilege, why should your friends, servants, children be diffident? Again, if Truva was fit for your favor, why not Arjuna also? In the best translation, nine-tenths of the beauty of the original is lost. The subtle suggestiveness of words or the wonderful magic of expression can never be translated. The book in the original will charm the reader, as it charmed the audience that enthusiastically gathered from day to day in 1290 at the temple of Navasa, where chapter after chapter was delivered ex tempore and taken down by the devoted disciple Satchitananda. When the work was finished, his master and brother, Nivrititev, said to Nyeshwar, quote, We have had a good treat, but now let us have something original. End quote at which Dhyaneshwar composed the Amrita Nubhav, the taste of nectar, at ten successive sittings. The book reveals the same grasp of the subject, but being more difficult and less rhetorical, is not as popular as the first. The message of Dhyaneshwar, as contained in these two books, derives peculiar significance when we remember how different it was from his own character and predilections. Generally, it so happens that the father of a revolution is himself, in part at least, the child of those forces which, under his guidance, are ultimately responsible for the changes brought about in thought and life. 
when, for instance, Mr. Tilak discards the authority of accepted commentators and gives us a new and convincing interpretation of the Lord's Song, we know that he is preaching a doctrine which, even independently of the Gita, he might have preached, a doctrine which is in consonance with his own opinions, in consonance also with the spirit of the times. But it is very difficult to lay aside your opinions and preach a gospel that is required by the condition of the country. That is what St. Yaneshwar has done. Sister Nivedita gives us a beautiful description of the master as I saw him, of the lifelong struggle raging in the heart of her master, Quote, of how, though trying to remain faithful to the banner of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa, he delivered a message, the utterance of which often used to strike him as a lapse. End quote. She has told us how quote, he would struggle against thoughts of country and religion and make of himself the poor homeless wanderer to whom every country and every religion should be alike, and yet how before he even knew it, end quote, he would be spreading broadcast those words of faith and hope which sent a thrill through the hearts of his countrymen, making them conscious of their own destiny. Similar praise must also be given to Dhyaneshwar. He was a great yogin and jnanin, and yet he had preached the doctrine of bhakti because he was aware of the needs of society. Like many philosophers, he did not condemn karma, for he knew that however necessary a strictly monastic life may be to an advanced sadaka, that was neither helpful nor desirable for the ordinary man. He must also be praised for having reconciled the various contending factions by preaching equal devotion to all the deities, the Puranas, in spite of their real service to the cause of religion, have by establishing the superiority of particular deities over others, brought a spirit of intolerance in a religion full of toleration. But the religious revival of which Nyaneshwar was the pioneer would have nothing to do with such contemptible differences. His writings contain passages where Shiva and Vishnu receive equal share of devotion. This is the more remarkable, as perhaps he preferred for himself, the Nirguna form of worship. The truth is that he and other leading saints tried to unite all elements of Hinduism and thus present a solid front to the disintegrating influences that came in the wake of the Mohammedan conqueror. It was a deliberate step in that process of assimilation about which we shall have to speak something later on. End of section 3, read by Sandra. Section 4 of Sri Nyaneshwar, A Sketch of His Life and Teachings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sri Nyaneshwar, A Sketch of His Life and Teachings by Anonymous. The appearance of these two books considerably enhanced the high reputation Nyaneshwar had attained. Unlike the politician, the Hindu saint requires no newspapers no organization for the propagation of his ideas. He need not even leave his place, and still thousands of people would come from the most distant corner, sit at his feet, and learn. Nyaneshwar had the same experience, and yet not content with the success his mission had achieved. He started ostensibly for a long pilgrimage, no doubt, but really to carry the truths of the Vedanta to the remotest parts of his country. He was accompanied by his brothers and sister by numerous friends and many disciples. The very fact that the party included such men as the goldsmith Narhari, the potter Gora, and the gardener Samfta, names respected to this day by even orthodox Brahmins, shows the extent of the awakening. The cry of free primary education of these days is only a revised edition, so to say, of the universal religious education prevalent in India since the days of Buddha. India never lacked education. When arts and crafts were not dependent upon literacy, the necessity of imparting secular education, in addition to the religious one, was justly not felt. The career of wealth, of glory, of ambition and heroism was open to the man who could not even spell his name, and who was as ignorant of the six systems of philosophy as of Homer or Virgil. At Pandarpur, the party was joined by Namdev, the son of a tailor, than whom the god Vidal had no more fervent devotee. To him, Vitopa was not the stable, stone, image that he is to the ordinary bhakta. 
Amdave played and talked with him, was free to love and in moments of petulance and anger to chide the god, whose banner is even now carried by more than a million people in Maharashtra. It is unnecessary to follow the saintly group, visiting shrine after shrine, bathing in sacred rivers, blessing the weak, convincing the doubting, themselves alternately lost in mute ecstasy and eloquent song. The task of preaching bhakti and knowledge to the vast concourse of people who greeted them wherever they wended their way was generally entrusted to Namdev, whose power of waking up the latent fire of bhakti in the hearts of his hearers was unrivaled. Sometimes it was Gyaneshwar who addressed them, or Gora the potter, and Visoba Kechar. It was a triumphal tour, and can favorably compare with the journey of the Swami Vivekananda from Colombo to Almora, when in 1896 he returned to India from his successful mission to the West. A few words are necessary to enable the reader to have a general idea of the religious revival of which Gyaneshwar was the pioneer. It has been sometimes stated that the revival was a revolt against caste and Brahmanical oligarchy, that it was a crusade against social abuses and inequalities, and that all the saints and prophets from Nyaneshwar and Namdev down to Tukaram and Ramdas carried on in their own way the work of social uplift, which interrupted owing to the wars and revolutions of the 18th century, has again been, under more favorable auspices, taken up by the great social reformers of the 19th century. There is more imagination than truth in this statement. It is true that they were social reformers in the sense they reformed the society of their times by holding up the ideals of charity, piety, benevolence, and God's surrender. The mind of man is generally too fond of the form, and is often forgetful of the spirit and by laying special emphasis on the essentials of religion, they did succeed in making the people think more of the spirit than of the forms. But it can never be truly said that they were social reformers in the accepted sense of the phrase, and the reason is evident. In the first place, it must be noted that from the 11th or 12th century to the end of the 17th, the influence of the Brahmin was purely intellectual. It is true that he was the repository of religious knowledge and was indispensable on occasions when religious ceremonies were to be performed, but in the body politic he occupied only a very subordinate place. Almost all the political leaders of those times, big Inamdars and Jagidars, with administrative powers and military equipment, were non-Brahmins. Their wealth, their social status, their political influence might have excited the envy of any ambitious Brahmin. The Shirkas, the Mohitas, the Yadavs, the Bansalas, to name only a few, all these had nothing to envy in the social status of the Brahmin. Strangely enough, the Brahmin also was quite content with his lot. There was no rivalry, no jealousy, no competition between the Brahmin and the non-Brahmin. These evils did not creep till at least Balaji Vishwanath became the Peshwa in 1714. Till that time the so-called lion and the so-called lamb drank of the same stream. These religious preachers did not break the barriers of caste, simply because there were no serious barriers awaiting the advent of the social reformer. On the contrary, they tried to strengthen all those bonds which were calculated to keep alive the Varnashram system, which it was their ideal to reinstate. Their writings do not reek of that Brahminophobia which has characterized the utterances of so many non-Brahmins, especially during the last few months. They have, no doubt, scathing criticism on hypocrites and impostors, but these blessed souls are found in all classes alike, and the Brahmin had no special monopoly of them. They used their lash not on the Brahmin, but on vice. Their criticism was abstract and not concrete. They were for caste distinctions, although against caste jealousies. They were against intermarriages. They did not favor such violation of caste discipline as a Brahmin's taking his food from the hands of a sudra. Vide Nishvari, chapter 13, verse 674. Their mission was love, and that love no artificial fencing of caste or color could keep in bounds. On rare occasions they did indeed break these rules of caste, which again and again they have emphasized in their writings. To cite an example, Ekanath, 1528-1599, on one occasion took his meals in the house of a Mahar. 
but any reader who will care to read a hundred lines from his works will find that he is deadly against all breaking of caste discipline. Tukaram, himself a Shudra, has never for once even reviled the Brahmin because he is a Brahmin, and even he is in favour of all those caste distinctions which, owing to the blast of Western civilization, are rapidly disappearing in the clouds. We might break caste or maintain it, just as we please, but it is really unjust to drag the names of these saints in controversies, the issues of which can be decided on independent lines of thought and argument. What then was the mission of these saints and prophets? What is their place in the history of their times? What service did they render to the country? It was their glorious privilege to rouse the hearts of their countrymen to the faith which was their birthright. Even in countries noted for their organizing power, there is the danger of the masses remaining comparatively ignorant of their religion. The story is told of a great bishop visiting one of the mining districts in England and asking one of the miners whether he knew Christ. What is his number? asked the man, thinking that Christ was his fellow laborer. That is the sort of ignorance which the leaders of the national thought ought to guard against, especially in times of wars and revolutions when the fate of the nation is in the melting pot. If Rama and Krishna had been to the Indian peasant no more than Christ was to this typical laborer, then the Muslim proselytizer would have succeeded in his mission quite easily and within no time. While estimating the services of the Maratha saints and prophets, the fact must never be overlooked that the period of the religious revival brought about by them synchronized with the occupation of the Maratha territory by the Muslim invader. Till the times of Nyaneshwar, the shock of the Muslim conquest was not felt in the Deccan. The North Indian plains were already red with the blood of thousands of soldiers, bravely but hopelessly fighting for the cause of their country and religion. The tide at last swept over the whole of Maharashtra, and when the Muslim came, he brought not only his sword, but Koran also. This twofold mission of the Muslim adventurer, it was the duty of the nation to resist. The political leaders were weak and therefore helpless. Consequently, the invader established himself in the country almost without opposition. It was exactly at this time that the great wave of religious revival started. That is why, instead of being a controversial movement, it was entirely assimilative and synthetical. It was no time to quarrel whether Shiva was greater than Vishnu or whether the Advaiti was right and the Dvaiti or qualified dualist wrong. All those controversies, whose echoes and re-echoes from some other parts of the country were still heard, were all hushed up. It did not matter which deity you worshipped so long as you remained a Hindu. The political unity which Shivaji only partially succeeded in making was preceded by social and religious solidarity. The Reformation movement in Europe, with which this movement is incorrectly compared, started long after the last crusade with the Turk was fought. But here in Maharashtra, the movement, as it synchronized with the rule of the Muslim, was essentially national, though inevitably disguised as religious. And as time passed on, as the political awakening became more and more pronounced, the religious leaders also became more and more national, until at last in Ramdas we see the patriot saint whose political fervor was equaled only by his religious faith. It is true that Tukaram never plunged into the flood, but only contented himself with standing on the bank of the national awakening. But even he, so indifferent to worldly matters, blessed the movement, and when Shivaji approached him in the spirit of a disciple, asked him to seek the aid of St. Ramdas as the fittest man to guide. When these points are remembered, the reader will see why the movement assumed this synthetical form, why the Brahmin still continued to monopolize his priest craft, why even those forms, ceremonies, and rituals which had outlived their usefulness were so jealously kept intact and observed with all the intense devotion of a fanatic. The one work, therefore, which the great saints of Maharashtra set themselves to do was awakening the hearts of the people and unifying them by the bond of love for God and religion, and this they did with a persistence and success that is truly marvellous. If even after the lapse of more than two centuries, Quote, it is hard to convince people who have Tukaram in their mouth of the intrinsic moral superiority of the Bible. End quote. How much more difficult his task must have appeared to the Muslim missionary in dealing with the contemporaries of Anamdev.
and Tukaram, Ekanat, and Ramdas. Space forbids us from describing at great length the services of these saints and prophets to their language and literature, and yet it is impossible to pass over it in silence. It can safely be said that if there is any force, rhythm, or power of expression in the Maharati language, that is entirely due to these saints and prophets who, when Marathi was neglected everywhere, took this famished orphan and nursed it with all the love at their command. The language really stood in need of protectors. It did not find favor with the pundit who was too full of Sanskrit, and from the fourteenth century onward it ceased to be the official language. Discarded by prince and pundit, by court and camp, it sought shelter at the feet of these saints. It is their writings which gave Marathi a dignity which hitherto it lacked. Their success was sufficient to induce literary aspirants to imitate their example, and the result was a mass of literary matter of which perhaps a hundredth part only has hitherto been brought to light by Marathi antiquarians. They were prolific writers, all of them. To compose verses by the thousand was quite an easy thing with them. Their ambition was to write crores of verses. Namdev is credited with being the author of 96 crores of Abhanga's verses, and though this is a physical impossibility that shows the ambition of the writers or expectations of their readers, it is true that much of this literature is marred by a want of the sense of proportion, by artistic inelegance and by tiresome repetitions, but this is because the authors did not get any regular literary training and in spite of their literary faults, even the most prejudiced reader will have to admit that the works they have bequeathed us are full of the aroma of spiritual faith and insight. This is not the place to describe the growth of the Marathi literature, or to describe how, from being the handmaid of religion, poetry grew to have an independent throne for herself. One or two points, however, deserve special mention. The literature of these times deals almost exclusively, directly or indirectly, with religious ideas and religious personages. It can roughly be divided into four parts. 1. The Exposition of the Vedanta. This is found in Nyaneshwari, Amrita Nubhava, Ekanati, Bhagavat, and works of this type, all written in verse. 2. Songs of Religious Ecstasy, mostly composed in the Abhang meter which is an adaptation of the Anushtuk meter. 3. Didactic poetry, also in the same meter, containing maxims of good conduct, strictures on the vices of hypocrites, and 4. Stories from the Ramayan and the Mahabharat. This forms the narrative poetry which, written in various meters, has reached high-water mark in the writings of Sridhar, Mukteshwar, and Moropant. After his return from the pilgrimage, Nyaneshwar and his brothers, with their youngest sister, led an even course of life at Alandi. They never married, they never worked for their livelihood. They had only one occupation in life, service of God. If they saved society, that was solely because they wanted to serve God through society. To elevate the depressed and to console the miserable were the basic elements of their religion. As Mr. Tilak has truly said in his recent book on the Gita, quote, to make the individual soul universal, whereby the meanest creature in this world becomes only a manifestation of the Almighty, and therefore a meet object of worship, is the highest form of devotion compared to which the offering of incense and flowers to him in the privacy of your room or the solitude of the temple, though helpful, is far less elevating. End quote. It is a kind of yanana. This service of society and the man who never draws a breath for himself is the greatest saint, such was Yaneshwar. But the success of his mission awakened the jealousy of many, some of whom had their own axe to grind. One of them was Changadeva, a great yogin claiming to have lived for fourteen centuries. Anxious to test Yaneshwar, he once started for Alandi. Riding on a fierce tiger, tamed only by the superior powers of yoga with a serpent for his whip, he marched, followed by a regiment of disciples. He had intended to vanquish Yaneshwar, but was himself half vanquished when he saw Yaneshwar coming forward to receive him by moving a wall. The conversation that followed convinced Changadeva that he had caught a tartar. 
Ultimately, he disbanded his disciples and himself became one at the feet of our hero. Whom the gods love, die young, says the proverb, and in this case the gods were but too anxious for the return of one of their own company. So on 25th of October, 1296, two years after Alaudin's invasion of the Deccan, Yaneshwar closed his brilliant career by entering into eternal samadhi amidst the subdued sobs of his own loving sister, brothers, disciples, and friends. He was barely twenty-two. Before the first anniversary of his death, his sister and brothers followed him too, unwilling to live in the void caused by their brother's death. So ends the story of Yaneshwar's life, the history of his inner struggles, if there were any, of his mental and spiritual development is hopelessly lost to us. What remains is a series of bare facts, happily well authenticated, and a succession of miracles whose account, proceeding though it does from contemporary writers, is in these days of rationalism often rejected. To my mind, the greatest miracle which this boy saint wrought was the immortal book which he composed when barely fifteen. There he stands before the mind's eye of his reader in the temple at Navasa, the light of knowledge radiating from his countenance, holding the audience bound by the spell of his eloquent words. To me, however, the picture is far less appealing than the other, in which the saint as yet undiscovered, begged from door to door, returning not railing for railing, but love for hatred, compassion for cruelty, and nobility for mean conduct. The children of the ostracized Vital Pant became the religious leaders of their time. The beardless begging boy is the spiritual light of six centuries. He conquered Maharashtra and made it prostrate before the throne of Vitoba. From his time, Pandarpur became the Banaris of the Marathas. At a time when religion was in the hands of pandits and a sealed book to the people, he spread broadcast the truths of the Vedas, and what a love for his people himself a great yogin and a follower of the great Shankaracharya, for them he discarded like Vivekananda the bliss of Samadhi and the stimulating silence of the cave and worked for and amongst them. Personally, partial to Inanna only, he preached bhakti and sanctioned karman. He opened their heart and kindled their spirit, and though the political complications of the next two centuries put a temporary check on the religious revival, yet with the coming of Ekanat, it rose with a rebound, extended to the remotest corners of Maharashtra, and made religion first a rallying sound and then the war cry of the people. The religious revival made the subsequent movement against the Muslim conquerors possible, and though the credit of building Swaraj must be given to Shivaji and his followers, yet the contribution of the leading saints and prophets towards the development of the idea of nationality must never be overlooked, for the patriotism of those times was based not on economics, but on religion. End of section 4 And end of Sri Yanashvar, A Sketch of His Life and Teachings by Anonymous